Good evening, and welcome to Inches and Cubes, your Toronto-based Warhammer 40k podcast. As always, it's me, Point and Click Nick. Me, Adam the Truest Axe. And me, Paul Mr. Fist Fowler. And we'll be bringing you all the latest news, uh, mainly of the games that we've played and what we've been working on. <laughs> but uh, sit tight and enjoy this musical break. Just like throwing. Um, like, I'm always the last one on the list. Well, now you, it's, you gotta. Th- throw me through the loop. Yeah, man. You get a loop thrown. This whole episode's gonna be a loop. It's alright. I'm just gonna. I'll just. Uh, I have an entire Facebook group of people wanting to go for pints, and they're just trying to get me to go out for pints right now. Well, it's not specifically to get me to go for pints. That would be crazy. Is it? Would it? Yeah. Wouldn't it? I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, do you want to keep going on this track? I mean, we might as well. It's only 31 seconds. Okay. Well, welcome back to, uh, our podcast. We've been off the air for a little while. Yep, life gets in the way, but we're now at episode oh, 26. 26. That's a lot of episodes. Uh-huh. Um, we're all back in the same room. It's great. And we're here to talk today about uh, Space Clowns. Yep. You're getting the Harlequin Codex today. Uh, we'll probably one we we'll probably call this one the last laugh or he who laughs last laughs best. He, something about laughing. Yeah, yeah. I'm, we, the, yeah, you'll see. Or, it. or something like Shakespeare related. We'll figure something out. Yeah, yeah. We're we're smart. Um, but before we get into that, uh, how's everybody been? Ah, pretty good. I'm pretty thirsty. September's been. Uh, September's gone by really quick. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I feel like the whole summer was kind of like a steamroller, and it's just like there's no stopping it. Yeah, my guess. Yeah. So, Paul, you brought this one introduce this to us. Yeah, this is Three Knocks. It's, uh... Oh, this is the worst. It's uh, a Bose. It's a strong beer. It's a nice... From the Wild Oats series. And it's a sticky alt. Uh, and let's see what we got. Um, yeah, it's it's got nothing... Uh, no, no bottle copy, which I kind of like. Uh, it does have a list of ingredients... Which is local spring water, organic barley malts, organic hops, and brewer's yeast. And that is it. Nice. Uh, so it's certified organic, which is better than those crystalline beers that we've been drinking. <laughs> and that is a terrible pour. I'll take that one. All right. There you go. Don't panic. It's organic. Look at that color, eh? Yeah, that's nice. That is a nice color beer. Bose knows what's up. They Ooh. really do. So for those... Uh, Enjoying this podcast audibly. It is a nice amber red color. Smells great. Mm-hmm. Smells like beer. Yeah, it smells aftershave. Like, like, smells like my dad's. Like, ooh, yeah, that's aftershave. just a nice full bodied beer. Yep, tastes nice. Um, it's probably good for you, I bet. There's a bunch left on the bottle. Where's Bose at again? Ottawa. Uh, Ottawa? No. Yep. Van Leek Hill. Close to Ottawa? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Near Ottawa. Yeah. Yeah. Inside Ottawa. <laughs> I love the... Uh, might as well mention the comment we got. Like, we do too many sours and stouts. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I know. I've been saying that for nigh on a year now. Yeah. I, well, you know, it's just so... It's so encouraging and exciting to get a comment like that even. Because the guy was so sincere. Like, he was coming to Toronto, and he was actually using our podcast as, like, a launch pad for his discovery of the local beer here. I was like, that's cool, right? It's, yeah. it's neat that we can kind of hit those two fronts and actually have someone enjoy both sides of this. It's exactly the reason that we do the podcast. Yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah, it's uh, it's got so, a nice... So for you, sir, this Bose, if you are getting out to Ottawa at all, fabulous. It's got a little bit of a funk to it, which I like. Yeah. That's like a real, been, yeah. real mild funk. A, they call it Brett. No, the, the funk. It's yeah, it's called funk. Like, oh, it's called Brett. No, Brett is the type of yeast. I have a friend named Brett. Like you can but that get, funky, the funkiness generally it, is associated. Like if you get a wine, well, no, that is like funky. Yeah, you would. There's no Brett yeast in it. Yeah, you wouldn't call it. That's what Brett. they call it. No, you wouldn't. No, Brett is the type of yeast. Brett is like a airborne yeast. Like it's organically harvested. That's, or it's, that's fine. But they, <laughs> that's what they that's what they call it in the wine world. Yeah, because like if it has a funk to it, it it's because it's gotten yeast. some of the bread yeast from yeah, the air. Yeah, 
Yeah. So like, but a like funk flavor profile is different because there's like you're a, funky. That, well, there's like super funk beers that you can get that like they'll brew a batch, take reserve some, and throw that into the next batch that they make. So there's like fifty year batches. It's kind of like a sourdough of mm. beer. You know I, mean? I love sourdough. You should get the uh, super funk beer. I've had a Sam go. Adams one and it tastes wild. Get Maybe learned. Like, yeah. Get learned on the funk. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so let's uh, let's go into the games that we play. General is our armchair, uh, is what we call that around Ooh, here. Hobby desk first. I don't know. Let's do hobby desk first. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. What do you well, got going on, Paul? Uh, what I've been doing. So I finished up the attack dogs for Wild West Exodus. Uh, they're a lot of fun. Just I I dry brushed them metal, washed them like five times with like different washes. So I went um, Secret Weapon, Heavy Sepia, or Dark Sepia, then Nuln Gloss, and then the the Griffin Sepia, or Seraphim Sepia, from GW, just to get like a really nice, sort of, uh, like, kind of old, not really oxidized metal, because like, they're in the desert, it wouldn't oxidize uh, completely. Yeah. Or it would be slow to oxidize, so I just wanted it to look dirty and sort of like uh, windswept. So I did that, hit them with a matte spray, went great. Um, I like their little game piece bases, so they're they beveled. Are, yeah, they are interesting. And they have like a lip on them, so like while I was flocking the bases, it made this like nice little pool of glue, so I was able to just pile stuff in there really well. Um, and I finished the Doc Holiday model, too. Uh, he was a lot of fun. He's got, like, a rebreather, which is kind of cool, because Doc Holliday was a, uh, he had consumption, so, like, he couldn't breathe that great. It's a sexy disease. It is a sexy disease, and Val Kilmer was a sexy man in Tombstone when he played Doc Holliday. Um, yeah, I did, like, a, a fancy kind of red, um, red vest on him, and a, a green cravat, just to make him, like, stand out a bunch. Uh, and got to use that turquoise uh, recipe that I'm always going on about for the black. And it just adds a lot of depth. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, you can't really see his face, so there's not a lot of face work that I did. Then I knocked together three Primaris for a Karsharadon, sorry, Karkaradon's uh, kill team. And I... Sw I used a Tartarus pattern helmet for the sergeant, so it looks slightly different. Yeah, it looks really good. Yeah, so it's it's got, like, a full face instead of, like, the, the Primaris sort of slits that are diagonal to the nose. Um, and I gave him a lightning claw that'll count as a power sword, and it's the uh, Mark III one from the, the plastic Mark Threes. And, yeah, and I just want a bunch of those. That's what, like, the, uh, the fingers pointing, the two... Index and middle finger pointing and everything else, like, curling up. Yeah. yeah, and, like, as opposed to it being a power fist with claws on the back of it, this is actually something that is just claws. Yeah. Uh, I really, I really like the way that he turned out. Um, the other guy, I swapped in a... I had, like, a, some of the push fit guys, and they like... And it comes with an alternate lieutenant and a guy with a... Uh, and Auspex, and yeah, just a couple other things. I swapped into a different head using, I think, an aggressor head. So he's yelling, and I was able to use the uh, the Scale 75 flesh set to go like really weirdly sallow flesh. Uh, so they're not quite as white as I did before. Well, they're more white than the other the other set of Karkaradons that I've done before. They had this like bluish tint, which I that was okay, but didn't love. So now I've been able to like get like very pale skin, white hair, black eyes. They look they look really cool. Um, and I did the same basing scheme on them as I'm doing the Wild West Exodus stuff. Uh, threw in a little bit of static grass, which I don't normally use, but I figured why not. And I picked up uh, the, this little pack of uh, scale flowers. It looks so great. But yeah. Man, like be cool and put like little tiny flowers on your stuff. Uh, gamer's grass? Uh, I don't. I think it might be secret weapon. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just a really good idea. A little yellow and pink flowers. Yeah. Uh, just to like add this pop of color. And I think, I think 
That is it. I also did some field repairs on a uh, Leviathan. Like, when I took him out of his little box at the 30K event, which we'll talk about in a little bit, like, his legs had separated from his body, had separated from the base. Oh, no. So I was like, I was like, time to be cool about all of this. <laughs> it's only my favorite model. <laughs> like that's, that's a tough one. Yeah. Well, at, least, so. at least I didn't break it. Yeah. Was it just super glue? Just yeah, kind of like, yeah, I just super glued it. No, no, but I mean, like, when it broke, like, the super glue just lost its hold and it kind of separated, or was it, like, a torsion thing? It was, I think it just popped. Like, I, I, I've had that before, where, like, the super glue is just like, nah. Yeah, like, I'm done. It's been a while. Yeah. I'm out. Because you, like, look at it, you're like, the super glue is on one point of the contact, and then it's, like, not on the other. The other one's, like, pristine, and you're like, that doesn't that, that make weird. any sense. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess it makes sense. Like, that's where it's going to shear. Yeah. But, um,. Yeah, anyway, so I fixed him up. He's fine. Good. I think that's everything. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while. It has been, been a while. It's like five, five weeks. Yeah. 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 Oh, and I got, like, all the bases <clears throat> done for the Wild West Exit of the stuff and did the dry brushing on the bikey guy. Um, so, nice. Yeah, I'll be able to finish those off probably a week, two weeks. I'm gone all this weekend. I'm going to go to the Catalina Wine Mixer. Woo! It's Wine and Grape Fest, but I just keep calling it the Catalina Wine Mixer because I'm a millennial and I can only relate to things through media. Hey, I get that reference. <laughs> so the one in St. Catharines? The... Yeah. Nice. Yep. Yeah, that's my uh, big project. I don't know if I... Was I talking about the obliterators? Yes, I was talking yeah. about my plans for them. So in September, I received the bodies and was able to completely put them together and have started to throw paint down on them. Um, so I bought the bodies off of a bit site, and one of the things I didn't realize, because I was like, oh man, I can buy six bodies for like 20 bucks, that's awesome, was that they didn't come with the shoulder pads. Yep. Uh, so I had to rig up some extra shoulder pads, because it's literally just like plastic. So what I got was the... It's actually kind of interesting. The Dark Angels bikers have the front part of the bike with the wings on them. Yeah. And so I got a couple of those from Phil, and I just cut off the wings, and they're about an inch long, and put them on the shoulder pads. The oh, shoulder that's... pad, like, goes up um, in, like, an Emperor's Children-style wing. I borrowed a tentacle maker from Nick G, and was able to do tentacles leading from the face all the way, like, back behind. There's so much cool, like... Um, vents and stuff in the Custodes kit mm -hmm. on the back that I was able to just drill with the Dremel in there and slot the hoses in so it actually looks like kind of jury rigged. Like it's yeah. definitely like somebody took these things but it looks more than just like hey the hoses have been glued yeah, like, to the back. And that's I think I was saying that on the podcast like you counter or you sink those yeah. hoses as opposed to like try to make it look like the, and it looks way better. Yeah. And yeah, I've, I've been putting paint down on them, and we'll hopefully get them done by the end of the month, because I want to put some work on them tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And plugging along at uh, painting up the rest of my orc kill team. Oh yeah? Yeah. Nice. Just more commandos. A Luda. A Spana boy. Yeah. I need, I need like, three or two Reavers, or whatever they're called. Isn't there like a three reaver kit? Yeah, good luck finding that now. The kill team's out. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> like... mm, yeah. It, it is funny. I've heard a couple people, uh, totally unrelated, just totally unable to find um, base troop kits. Yeah. Like Connor's been looking for a Pathfinder box for forever. Uh, there's been like, I think Skatari Rangers are impossible to find in the city. James was telling me that he was looking for. Something else that's just crazy. He was oh, he was looking for the Harlequin troop box and he can't find it. Yeah, no, it's gone. So, anyways, if anyone has two either push fit or preferably multi part reavers out there, send them to Paul Fowler, care of Paul Fowler, or just email the podcast and tell me how to buy them from you. Oh, I was like, how are you going to email things to a podcast? Yeah, well, we have an email address, Nick. Well, what is it? Physical things. They're not going to be able to email you models, Paul. What? Uh, you, 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 start, you start with an email because yeah. Paul probably doesn't want to advertise his personal address on there it is. the I will, Yeah, so it's just oh. inchesandcubes at gmail.com. Yeah, email us there. Zing. There you go. Uh, Adam, what you get painted? Mm. We'll keep it to five minutes. <laughs> okay, here, we're on the clock. 
Uh, so man, I've I painted so much stuff. I had to look, I had to go back on my phone and look for the last five weeks what I've been doing. Did I talk about uh, my Sons of Medusa Castellan? Well, not mine, but Sons of Medusa Castellan that I was working on. No, I don't think so. What was, the, what was the last thing I talked about? Do you guys remember? Like a Custodes Army, probably, or a yeah, Nighthawk yeah. Army? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Custodes and Nighthawk, yeah. Okay, yeah. So then it was this, like, super bright lime green Sons of Medusa uh, Castellan Knight. My fluff bone hurts, because <laughs> that's not how knights work. <laughs> that's what the customer asked for. I mean, yeah, that I understand. <clears throat> um Anyway, so that was that was really fun, and I just like have this easy system for painting up nights really fast now, and I just I just love doing them. They're such a joy, even though they're such a big model, they just come together so nicely. Um, it's like at this point for me, it's like almost painting a really big space marine. <laughs> I like I kind of get that though. Yeah, like that makes sense. One, like once you know how to solve that model, you're like, yeah, I can do that. Like I, I was I was thinking about that a little while ago, about how like I can paint space marines so fast like if especially if they're not yellow yeah. like yeah yeah you don't have to like do 28 layers yeah if it's just like oh like base the 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 like mid-tone wash mid-tone again on a highlight like damn son you can crank that stuff out yeah totally um so then so from there <clears throat> i uh Taken on a couple. I've taken on the 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 cheese ball commission, the Catechin detachment, and the Blood Angel detachment of fifteen scouts and two Smash captains. You better get it done quick. I don't think that's going to be around for <laughs> yeah. much longer. I oh, know. I totally know. But hey, it's what the customer asked for. I can't control the weather. Um, but anyways, it's been it's been super fun, and he's going to do guard anyways. I think the Blood Angels is kind of the one he's going to lose out on, but the guard he's doing anyway. So so he's gonna he's gonna love the Catechins. Um, but it's, I, when the Catechins first came out, I did, like, a small army of them, and it's nice to do it again now that I'm that much better at painting, and, um, I have so, so much more efficient systems, um, uh, because, like, painting all that flesh back then was such a daunting task as, as basically a new painter, right? Yeah. Um, but now it's, like, it's just such a joy to, and to see them, to have, my big thing is, like, every, every model in my army is basically painted to the same standard, and so, like, when you do a guardsman army, most people are like, ah, just slack on the infantry, you know? I'm like, no, I'm like, no, like, let's, let's have everything look nice. You it's know? funny that, like, you say that, because I know so many guard players that also reference, like, you know how everyone tells you, like, ah, you can slack on the infantry. I don't do that. And, like, everyone that I, like, all the guard armies I've seen lately, it's either people that have done that, and it's like, this looks crazy, and how do you have any friends? Or it's, like, people going back and, like, repainting stuff, and, mm. like... Yeah, I'm glad that, like, you know, I, I, I'm excited to see pictures of the, these catechins like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. paint all the eyes. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. Yeah, it only takes, like, five minutes. Uh, I guess. <laughs> for anybody who's interested in painting eyes, we did a video for the channel, so check it out. Um, nice. It's connected to the How to Paint Faces video. Yeah. So there you go. Go find that. Um, anyways, I did a big terrain commission, which was really fun, so part of it was just doing, just doing some city fight buildings to match a guy's table, and then he also wanted me to do some of the, he wanted me to paint some of that Sector Mechanica stuff to match our club's Necromunda table. Cool. It was kind of fun to go back and kind of do that again. Um, and that, did I do any personal stuff? Oh, dude, I did all the Mechanicus stuff, or Titanicus stuff, my apologies. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so two Warlord Titans, when can you ever say you painted two Warlord Titans <laughs> in your life? Uh, six Imperial Knights, and then a whole slew of terrain. Um, I, like, picked up one box of Titanicus stuff, like, looked at it and was like, the same for me, the same yeah. for me. No, and it's, it's certainly not, um, mm. I just really enjoyed the experience of of smashing it all together. Yeah, it looks cool. Um, Have you played a game yet? No, I haven't played a game yet because uh, a certain somebody, Raph, <coughs> copped out on me. Um, and then other than that, I've been too busy, so haven't been able to make up for that uh, upset there. Soon, though. Okay. It's, on, it's on the books. Definitely we're going to have some Titanicus videos coming out on the channel. Um, yeah, but that was really fun. It was just like, especially the terrain, like just such a 
crushable paint project, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. terrain, especially those, like, one pieces, like, they're so fun to just, like, do gray, dry brush up, wash, dry brush back up. And you're like, look how good I am. <laughs> it's good yeah. for the old confidence. Yeah. So, so there you go. I think, you know, I, I'm probably at my five-minute time limit, so even if there's something that I missed, we're good. Well, you brought up games, so... Let's play a game. What'd you bring us, Adam? Aha! Okay, what'd you grab first? The juice box? The juicy juice box? Not your everyday and ordinary juice box? It says two different things on it, so I don't know what it is. Yeah, right. Okay, let's decipher this. So it said the the label that is most prominent and is the most colorful says juice box, a New England pale ale. But the little sticker on top it says Citra and Hollertau Blanc. So, I guess Juice Box is their fruit line from Bandit. Right. Be. Oh, so they add, so they take the New England Pale Ale as a base, and then they add whatever, they do whatever to it. Yeah, is just my guess. I don't really mess with Bandit a whole lot. No, yeah. me neither. I bought this a few weeks ago and was planning on drinking it a while ago, but then I got sick, and so I didn't drink beer, and so then I had it in the fridge, so I brought it here. There you so go. I kind of forget. I'm like way out of context <laughs> for when I bought this. But anyways, this is from Bandit Brewery. They are a local Toronto brewery. Check it out, uh, Buddy O, um, who's following us. It's always <laughs> basically Dundas and Ronsi. Yeah. Yeah. It's good if they'll let you in. It's so busy. It's yeah, so it's busy. busy. Yeah. And they're dickholes about it every time I'm there. Are they? Yeah. Like we, I went there for a birthday party. And we were sitting outside, and there was eight of us, and Thank two you. more people showed up, and they were like, yeah, we only do eight per table. You're going to have to, uh, like, either stand or, like, move over to another table. That's we're so like, weird. Yeah, they're just... That's odd. Yeah. It, That's every, really odd. Every time I'm there, it's just something like that. Huh. I'm just not a big fan of their beer. Well, but I'll let you know in a second. You're not a big fan of the beer, or you are? Still not. Yeah, it's good. Like, I don't... Yeah. It's not, uh, fruity. Yeah, I want everything about this beer turned up. Yeah. <laughs> like... It's like, it's kind of, it's like bitter in the wrong way, almost. Yeah, like, how old is... What's your date? No date? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably not an age thing. But... Yeah. No, it's like... It's like it's like bitter, but it's not the nice like. Well, there's no carbonation lightening at, at the back, right? Mm. So like you're getting that bitter, and normal normally like effervescence, effervescence would like mess with that. Mm -hmm. But like, no. Oh well, you missed me. So and, but, we've been gone a month, and I I know I have at least eight games to talk about. Adam's got a bunch. Paul's probably got. I one. got five. Uh, but we're just going to do two each, yeah. I think. <clears throat> but I would like to do, if you guys wanted to do separately, like a rundown of the Horus Heresy event. Yeah. I was like doing that. But uh, I'll just start with uh, the two games that I'll pick. So one of them's uh, Heresy. So the Kitchener-Waterloo Heresy guys are planning a 4K event in early November um, that uh, Phil and I have both signed up to play. And... We just were just free on a Saturday afternoon and, and wanted to try out our 4,000 point armies, and we did, and it was a lot of fun. It was probably the shortest game of Heresy I've ever played at about two and a half hours. Um, he was running his custodes with a knight allied household. Mm -hmm. So he had the Serastus Archer on, uh, and then a normal knight, that's the one with the huge flamer, a normal knight gallant, and then his standard array of uh, custodes and Sisters of Silence. And I was able to turn the Emperor's Children up to 11, take a full 10-man Las Cannon squad with a Master of Signal and the Falchion. And that basically rounded it out to 4,000 points. Um, the Falchion, like, it does so much work at that level. It, honestly, it didn't do that much work. It just scared... <laughs> Him? How many times did it shut down a super heavy? Never. Never? No. Never hit once? No. 
No? Didn't no it didn't shut down a super heavy once. What did it, were you shooting at a super heavy? Uh no. So yeah, because maybe answer like that. Well, I wasn't shooting at a super heavy. Because, but because Phil got scared, you didn't give him a chance probably. Yeah. Yeah. So what basically what happened was um turn one I was able to drop down the five terminators with Kami Meltas behind his knight at Archeron. Mm-hmm. And the old Ion Shield rules, which I really like. I've always liked 7th edition Ion Shield rules for knights, where you have to pick which facing the shield's on. You don't just get a 4-up and vulnerable save around you. So he was looking at 10 Laz Cannons and the Volcano Cannon in the front, or 5 Melta Guns in the back. And I think he made the right call. He put them on the front. Mm-hmm. But then I got all hits and all pens and blew it up. See, First like... Time. Seven is so much like that, where it's like, I've made a mistake. I've lost this game. Like, yeah, it, I it, think that's just any Warhammer game, because I, I feel the exact same way about 8th uh, about edition and, and misplacing things. Well, like, at, I guess, no, Horse Heresy at that point level is like that. Yeah. Like, at a lower point level, you're sort of like, yeah, well, I got, like, two redundancies. He can't take it out. But at 4,000, it's like... If you don't get first turn, dude is shitting on your army, and now you are playing with, like, 2,800 points. Basically, because what yeah. happened next is the Volcano... Mm-hmm. Sorry, the last Cannon Squad took out the other knight. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the Volcano Cannon was able to blow up uh, the, the the Dune ship. Yeah. The Karan Pattern Acquisitor. Um, what else happened in that game that was was super interesting? Oh yeah, Cacophony just firing back and forth with a bunch of custodes. Um, power spears are terrible. They're hilariously bad. Like, who has them? The custode jet bike. So they have like a D three shot last cannon, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. But if they charge, like they charge my terminators, and they're like, "We're AP three. and I was like, "Oh, mm, they should be AP two on the charge." No, power lances are not. Are they power lances or power spears? They're power. They're the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Still, it's so bad. Yeah, because you're there's plus one strength AP three on the charge, or just straight up strength uh, AP four in combat. So we char- ended up charging into a squad of cacophony, and I survived the first round. Mm-hmm. And the cacophony, and then we're just like beating each other with sticks, and nobody died for like three, four rounds of combat. That's really stupid. Yeah. That's just not how that should work. Yeah, that's not what that weapon should no, be. It was, no, it was very strange. Um, but then the coolest moment of the game was when he had gotten um, Constantine Baldor. He was running like a super huge character list. It was Constantine Baldor, Janisha Kroll, so both special characters from Talents of the Emperor. Mm-hmm. Uh, Janisha Kroll is Toughness 3, and she doesn't have Eternal Warrior, so she took a cacophony shot to the face and died, which was hilarious. And then... Uh, because this is, I like to do this. I sent my Praetor and his death, my death squad into his death squad, and his death squad completely wiped mine. Um, but I was able to bring Constantine Valdor down to two wounds. Combat was over. I had lost. I had an apothecary left to attack with at initiative step four. Three attacks, hit with two, wounded with two. Filled rolled double one for Constantine Valdor's save. And Constantine cool. Valdor went down to a pot carry with a chainsword. And he just conceded the game right there. Yeah, because <laughs> well, it sounds dork. like a lot of bad stuff happened. <laughs> yeah, it was it was bad rolls. Um, he rolled a lot of ones. Uh, and then, like I said, well, this is ten last cannons killing a knight. That makes perfect sense. Um, that's... Not with a four. Like, I still saw so that's ten mm-hmm. last cannons hitting on twos. Yeah, so... So one or two will miss. Statistically... To then I need a four plus to do anything. Mm-hmm. So we're we've got four if we're doing the math. Then they have a four and vulnerable save. So two. Yeah. So and I get two penetrating hits, and I ended up getting like six or seven. Yeah. So, but still, two is enough to like take the thing out, like cripple. Well, it. it's got six. He has, he has to roll perfect. He has to roll two explodes and then roll the d three damage. Yeah. If you're putting it to dice, like. It can that, happen. Yeah. yeah, that makes perfect sense. It can happen, but it's well, not, this it's is not what likely. I'm, this yeah. is what I'm saying. Like, this is what, like, 4K, 30K is like. Or, like, big games 30K. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, yeah. the, like I think 30K works best around 2,500. Like, 2,500, <laughs> maybe 28. But, like, I would, bigger than that. And then you're just, like, you're giving people the ability to, like, delete parts of your army. 
and then you can't hit back that hard. So, like, first turn is super important. Especially in an I go, you go game, like where there's no alternating units or yeah, like that, man. It's just it's wild to see like those big point cost games. Yeah, so, so is that, that was first game? Yeah, first game, and then I played a, a league game versus uh, Graham Sylvia on Sunday. Uh, trying out the new Obliterator list uh, that I wrote up for Chaos. Uh, basically, two squads of three Obliterators coming down with a Chaos Lord. The 20-man Lava Noise Marines, which I just love. Two squads of 15 Cultists. Uh, an Imperial Knight. Havocs. Demon Prince. Sorcerer. I think that's it. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. The knight uh, did some serious work. Honestly, more than anything else, it just took hits. Yeah, like, well, they draw fire, which is really yeah. important, especially when you've got that many noise marines and your obliterators. Like, they yeah. need to get... Yeah, they need to get into space uh, yeah. to do some work. The obliterators came down. So he was running a, a Raven Guard brigade in an objective-based game and was able to, like, put some points up on the board pretty quickly. Um... Man, scout bikers, or just bikers in general, with a storm bolter and a they put bolter. Out so many shots. I was just like, how do you have like eight shots a guy? Like that's really good up until you realize the bolters are terrible. Yeah, like against cultists, they're great. Yeah, so I mean, it's nice to have the the rock to one scissor, um, but like bolters are no. the freaking worst. No one's ever been like, oh, thanks God, he's got a bolter. Yeah, but, uh, but first, yeah, some people could say he's got a lot of boulders. It's true. True. That used to be, that was like the name of the game back in third. Like, can you make the guy roll more dice? Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, yeah, yeah the, the knight did its job. It uh, rolled a six on the thermal cannon and killed three aggressors turn one. Uh, he got really lucky because I was able to, I did a 12 inch, an 11 inch charge of the knight and then piled in. To his captain. Can you just, like, lose a game for this segment one time to get, like, some... I do, I do all the time. <laughs> no. But, uh, basically... <laughs> Not that he talks about it. Yeah. I hit him three times. I ended up hitting him three times with the Reaper Chainsword. But he had a Storm Shield and made all three saves on his captain. I, I was mean, like, ooh. Hmm. And somehow he got away from that. That doesn't make any sense to me. What? You're getting hit with literally a Chainsword that's on an excavator and your shield... Is protecting you from that. Yeah, but do you want it to cause mortal wounds and then, like, you've just got this thing that can mash anything? That'd be nice. Yeah, it'd, yeah, it'd be cool for you. <laughs> well, no, Dude, just, what else do, like... Just, just, do knights just, need to get better? Yeah, really? get out of here. No, I don't. I just, I just <laughs> like the old destroyer weapon rules a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, the obliterators came down. First round of shooting did absolutely nothing. I took, like, two wounds off a whirlwind and then two wounds off of a storm raven. My guy was playing a whirlwind. Yeah, he was playing a whirlwind. Oh my god! You brought yeah. like a like a sledgehammer to kill a baby duck. <laughs> I, I, we ended up winning like seventeen thirteen, and we went to turn six. Who is this? You're playing against Graham Sylvia. Um, it was a whirl. He had like a whirlwind and a thunderfire cannon in the back with a lieutenant. So it was it was doing some serious work. It like took out a bunch of my havocs. Um, but so I the obliterators whiffed, and the second time they opened up. They were able to kill, uh, they killed the Whirlwind, they killed the Storm, uh, the, no, the last cannons killed the Storm Raven, they killed the Thunderfire Cannon, and then they killed his, uh, Warlord. <laughs> I love that, it, like, one breath ago, you were like, he had a Thunderfire Whirlwind, and then the next time I got a chance, I blew it all up. <laughs> I did, because it was, because I watched it melt my squad of Havocs. I wasn't gonna let that stay alive. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the Thunderfire cannons, when they get going, can can really kill stuff. And but. he was using it smart, because he was using Tremor Shells on the Noise Marines. So every time he would target the Noise Marines, it means they were halved move, movement, halved advance, and half charges. So they were basically just stuck. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Uh, did you do the big squad of 20? Yeah, I did the big okay. squad of 20. Yeah, that's the thing to do with that. Yeah. But it was it was a good game. Like I said, it came down to uh, the Obliterators staying alive after a, a punishing round of shooting from him. And the knight surviving three rounds of shooting from a uh, five-man Devastator last cannon team. Oh, wow. Yeah, that shouldn't be. No. <laughs> Rotate ion shields. Yeah. It was good. Uh, with the Hogtown comp, you can't do that sort of cheese. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> you monster. Uh, and I, guess, I guess it's just our Hogtowner specifically. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, my two games, I played uh, Alexander Albuquerque, one of my favorite names and guys to play against and say. Um, just a real nice guy. Has a beautiful Valhallen uh, army. Uh, he was playing them as Cadians, I think. Um, and I played against my... I played my Necrons, and I just took it in the shorts. Oh, like, yeah? Yeah, like, Guard, I don't know what to do with them. I played another game at 1,000 points against Guard, and he brought three tank commanders and 60 Guardsmen. Like, I, just, I sit there, I was like, I, I can't win this game. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what to do with Guard. Like, he he had three Lehman Russ in the backfield that I was not even able to threaten. No. Just because in between that were, like, two Hellhounds... So many mortar teams, so they're just, like, dropping shit on me all day long. Um, and, yeah, just, like, the amount of fire it can put out, like, it's yeah. it's wild. I think the only way, the only guard army I've ever beat was with the orcs, and it was just fast, close combat. Like, I was, like, turn one charges, and that was it. Yeah. Like, I, I even got, like, my, I got uh, the Wraith Bomb off, and, like... The thing is, there were so many units that I couldn't, like, I either had to pick one unit and, like, kill that, and then I was not in combat, so yeah. I just got blasted by last guns, but, like, as soon as one would hit, then they all got the reroll, and they were all plus one ballistic skill, and they're all, like, it was just... All falling back and shooting from the combat. With yeah, and I was like, race. this, yeah. like, it, it, he was playing it smart, but I was like, this sucks to play, like, this is not... Yeah, guards, it's a tough nut to crack. It's a crazy, weird army to fight, and it's... It just feels like everything that you're trying to do, they've got either an answer to, or they've been doing it better all game. Well, especially with Cadians, right? Because you're like, the weakness of Guard and Tau is that they they hit on force. Mm -hmm. But then you've got so many mitigators to that, that they're never hitting on force. No, it's like, oh, we get plus one hit if we cause a wound, and like, oh, we're in this bubble, so we're just re-rolling. Like, go to hell, re-roll bubbles. Like, I think that, like, the more I think about it, the more I hate that mechanic. I agree. I don't like. I don't like it either. Like it just like I'm obviously going to use it like because one unit. It'd be cool if it was one unit, right? Like the way the Praetorian, uh, my will be done works. Right. For Necrons, like, where you're like pick one unit within six inches, you get the benefit of my special rule. Yeah, but like, like it's just wild that like, you know, it, it just promotes castling, right? It, it like, promotes castling well, because yeah. guard squads are so cheap. It really ramps it up to eleven, right? Because like normal guys would be like, oh, I have a a Chaos Lord who's affecting two, maybe three different units. Uh, and then Guard, it's like, I have a dude who's affecting probably five or six. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that was pretty wild. Um, and yeah, I ended up losing that game like pretty handily. Um, we, we were doing tactical objectives just because I don't often do that. So I was like, let's do that. And like, I was doing fine, but then... Um, like, we were playing the one where you can spend two command points and, like, generate a new one. So he just, like, did that twice because he had so many command points and was able to, like, shoot ahead of me and then, like, he didn't have to really worry for a while. And was he running Kirov's Aquila as well? Uh, no. No, okay. Oh, wait, maybe. I don't know. Like, regenerating command points? Uh, Every time he does a strategy. Probably. Yeah, that felt like something. I can't remember, but... Yeah, it was just like, ah, cool, man. Yep. Like, do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, Guard is certainly at the top of the tier right now, and, and yeah. he plays it pretty hard. So, and I'm, and that's like no, that's no sort of flack towards uh, like Alexander. Like, great dude oh, yeah. has that. If you're playing an all pewter army, like you are above reproach on like cheese. Because <laughs> like yeah, you've had it for it's a like, while, my guy. <laughs> I've got pictures with this army before. Like I was married, and before like. Yeah, you know, while Clinton was in office, get out of here! Yeah. Like, and you you deserve it. They deserve to be on top for a little bit, you know. Yeah, Gardev, so. Gardev had a hard run for a long time. I think. <laughs> I'm making an incredulous face at you. Yeah, how, I agree. How were they in seventh? I can't remember. They're pretty good. Yeah. Were they good? Back Sixth then? edition, they were like, I I feel like Leaf Blower was the first time people knew of a netless name. Yeah. Mm. Like. Anyways, that was that was game one. Uh, and then uh, one of the games I'll get into, and then I'll me and Adam can go back and forth. Uh, I played in the Heresy event that Hogtown put up a little while ago, and uh, a lot of those um, Waterloo guys came up, and that was a, just a ton of fun to see and meet all of them. Um, and I got to play... Oh, uh, I looked up who it was. Uh, one of the guys that came up from the States 
uh, who was playing the death card. I got to play him. That was Scott. a ton. Scott. Yep. Mm-hmm. Ton of fun. Great guy. Um, Solid dude. I played yeah. him too. It was great. Yeah. Uh, we were pulling up to park behind his, uh, behind a truck, and there was a Carcara Don's logo in the back of the truck. I was like, that's one of ours. And I, like, I mentioned it to him. He's like, that's my truck. I was like, this guy rules. Um, <laughs> but I got to play <coughs> Iron Warriors with my Imperial Fists. Adam Myers, what a great game. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I won really well. Um, it, it was just like a nice like back and forth slugfest. Like, oh, what's going to happen? And he had to play the objectives. And there were just like two turns where I didn't play the objectives like, and went instead to like wipe out a couple of easy kills. And that, that won me the game. But uh, my shield captain one-shotted his Praetorian with... Oh. Just, like, he got out of a Land Raider and charged him, and I just, like, bloop, poked him in the face with the spear and got a six on the wound. Excuse me. Instant death. Yeah. Just blew his head right up. Um, and then the next turn... His turn... No, my turn. Uh, the shield captain wiped out the rest of the, the squad that was with him. Let's just see him doing something for once. Yeah, well, that's the thing. He does work if it's not against you. Um, and it was kind of funny. He managed to immobilize the Achilles Dreadnought. So the Dreadnought was, like, zapping stuff with the uh, the Dread Spear. So I think he thought, like, oh, I don't have to worry. He's not in combat. And I was like, zap, zap, zap. Just like, yeah, it's bull. still a D3 shot last cannon. Yeah. It's still really good. <laughs> uh, and the other, like, really cool cinematic moment... I had the mortars up on the side of this big, um, like, uh, what's the, the Disappointed Eagle uh, Bastion? It wasn't that one, was it? It was like a big, like, one of the GW kit fortresses that somebody brought. Mm. Looks cool as hell. Um, Is that on Colin's table? That's the one Colin yeah. built. Yeah, he yeah. built that. So, well, like, oh, that big crazy thing. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Bless Colin for bringing that. But I had my mortars up there, and they had shatter shells, and he brought the... Uh, What's the the flyer with transport capacity? Storm Eagle. Storm Eagle. Yeah. yeah, he like flew the Storm Eagle by, and I just like opened up with the shatter shells, and just you know like it, you roll like it's, it's twelve shots. Yeah. yeah. So just like managed to take off the last two hull points, and the guys flew like it just cratered. <laughs> yeah. Right. Strength ten AP one. Yeah. Bam, dude's dead. But like I just love the idea of this thing like trying to like land, and these guys just like doom 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 doom. <laughs> like right into the side of it, and anyways, that was that was a ton of fun. Um, and uh, Adam, do you want to want to talk about the the thirty k event on the whole? Uh, on a, on the whole, not my games. Yeah, yeah, and then we can we can go back and forth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so generally the these guys are trying to tell a story, and we're all kind of showing up and participating in in the story that's unfolding. So in particular, this this one was. Uh, uh, a particular region of space, I forget what it was called. The Marion Gulf. Mar- yeah, the Marion Gulf, but more Oh, yeah, I can't remember the... Uh... Yeah. Um, so anyways, one of one of the moons or planets we were fighting over has had a uh, previously unknown uh, Eldar webway portal there, and so now the, the space marines have kind of wandered in there hoping to um, use it for some <laughs> kind of advantage, and so just all sorts of craziness was happening throughout this, this event. Which was great. Um, as far as the overall standings, I think the Imperium, the Loyalists, sorry, uh, yeah. held strong. Hella strong. Hella strong. There you go. Um, <laughs> Wait, who won? Not oh, the, the Loyalists. Loyalists. God, again? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, maybe you shouldn't be at the cottage when uh, <laughs> when people are trying to take over yeah. the Marion Gulf. That's yeah. true. They need, people need their war master. <laughs> That's it. Um, and I, I did not contribute much to that victory, but... Um, <laughs> But thankfully, I had some strong teammates, and we we pulled through in the end. Yeah, I um, went two for three, so nice. Yeah, I was I was only one for three. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean the uh, the previous event that we had that we did in this style had uh, lots of off the table interactions going on stratagems. So I really liked that. I really liked the organized um, aspect to that where we all had to like team up and really come up with a battle plan and like execute it. And that was, that was a really fun element that was, um, maybe missing from this one. I think we should reconsider that. I um, think you, like you could strike a balance between, cause I found that there was too much above table stuff last time. Mm. Like it just got way too complex. Like you were every, every army was able to like add a veteran game 
your your HQ was like leveling up and like getting abilities. Oh, that's that's different than what he's he's talking about. Like, and yeah, and then like yeah. on top of that, you have your like, oh, we're gonna give this stratagem to this player and this one, this one, and this one counters this one, and like, yeah. it is a lot of fun, but it's. I felt that like you sort of. I think you should either take army advancement and like pare that down a lot. Um, or, like, just leave it on the HQ or do the above-table stuff and not, like, yeah. both, because... Yeah, I really I really like the above-table stuff. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing, like, an extended campaign, like, six months, let's play once a month, twice a month, whatever, like, the army advancement stuff is great, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, you're you're getting veterans of this long war happening, yeah. right? Um, but, uh, but for an event like this, where it's literally two sides, like, there's no single player winner, right? Like not one player is coming out as the player of the match, right? We're we're going for the team, fighting for this like grander narrative. Um and so to get everybody in the command room together strategizing the big battle. Yeah, like that's the real... that's the part that I missed. Yeah. Like just the before game, like who are we playing? Like it was cool to get uh like to just be like, oh I wanna play this person. I'm calling this person out. I'm like, or like yeah. what table do you want to play and like yeah, the the totally. traders doing their matchups based on that. Yeah, as opposed to just getting assigned a table because these are the matchups at a Swiss tournament. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So it's... I think, I think like that element just yeah, just like formalize mm-hmm. that a little bit. And they they did have the the cool the cool elements that they did have was uh, um, to kind of influence this this storyline and, well, and have off, it unfold on the battlefield. The was, player pack was outstanding. Oh, just yeah, the design and like the the fluff that it written was fantastic. You really felt like you were getting immersed in in the story of it. Um, but they also had tables interacting with each other, which yep. was really great. And so the uh, the bastion thing that you were fighting over had a big like warlord titan gun sitting on top, right? Yep. And it was shooting at a spaceship in space, and so that was that was shaking up the zone mortalis table and causing all sorts of problems for the players playing there. Yeah, and I loved doing uh, that. The, what was that? I loved doing that. <laughs> you shot him a few times. Hell yeah, I shot him a few times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, the zone mortalis table, um, it had a kind of command room, and it was dropping bombs at the table next to it as well, uh, which was a different table than the one it was getting shot from. Um, which which had some great... I mean, it just put put you right in, in the narrative. Um, of course, on like our previous events, we also had uh, NPCs going on, and so the the kind of TOs, not TOs, because it's not really a tournament. Um, so the guys helping organize it were running around uh, playing these NPCs on the table as well, which made it uh, yeah, just really, again, immersive, uh, just fun to react to the environment and not just be like, okay, how do I absolutely obliterate my opponent? Yeah, um, like, that was that was a ton of fun. Like, such a well-thought-out idea. Um, like, yeah, because I played one table where, like, a bunch of Dark Eldar came out and, like, wiped out my... Uh, like, just crushed the back of one of my flanks to the point where, like, I was like, okay, I'm playing this game different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I played on that table, too. And, yeah. Um, and it totally, it, it, I was like crushing my opponent, um, and then the Dark Eldar came on, did the same thing to one of my flanks, and I, I just managed to recover and like obliterate all the Dark Eldar in one go. I didn't even shoot at them. You just ignored it? Yeah, I just ignored them, because like, I was playing the mission at that point. Yeah. I was like, head down, I'm, I'm doing this. Yeah. I was, I was ahead enough that I could afford to. Yeah. Um... But it was it was a good balancer for that game. Like it made that game so much more fun because otherwise it just would have yeah, just like really absolutely that. annihilated my opponent, right? Yep. Um, and I was playing against Colin, who's like a new player, super nice guy, contributes a lot, and so it's like it just wouldn't have been fun for him. But it like added such a great element to that that uh, was was good. Um, yeah. So what games did you play? Yeah, so there you go. So there's my game against Colin. He's playing Iron Warriors. I was I was playing Loyalist Luna Wolves. Um, my army typically consists of uh, two quad mortars that are sitting on the battlefield at the start of the game, a squad of plasmas and a rhino that's sitting there as well, uh, alongside my Spartan with just Aaron in it, and uh, a, a drop potting Leviathan. So that's kind of my what's on turn one, and then my second wave stuff, because I'm Sons of Horus, so I get reroll ones on my reserves, is two units of vets and uh, a javelin Nice. Um, that comes on later. Um, so that's kind of my army, and he was taken, 
uh, a, what is, what are the, a demolisher tank, and then same chassis, but the crazy laser gun in the front. Oh, the kind of... Open Decatur Laser Destroyer. There you go. Yeah, so he's running one of those, um, a couple tactical squads and rhinos, uh, two leviathans on foot, um, which was crazy. <laughs> two <laughs> leviathans, what a beast. Yeah. Uh, he had a big devastator squad of auto cannons. And Ooh, those, Iron Havocs. Ooh. Yeah. And then also the the crazy r- robot guard dudes of the big shields and big thunder hammer things. Oh, you brought the iron circle. Ooh. Yeah, that was awesome. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. So they were they were fun, but uh <clears throat> there was just a big line of sight piece of terrain block in the middle and uh and my leviathan kind of plugged one of the big lanes for him to get through and uh and started messing up his anti-tank stuff um which really basically that was the big play that kept him on the back foot the whole game because he uh he was running around with most of his infantry um oh the object the objectives were funny because they you didn't know what they were going to be and so it's when you controlled it you kind of rolled to see what it was so the very first one he jumped on top of was uh was booby trap. Oh man. <laughs> uh. And uh, yeah, kind of you know blew up a few guys from his unit, and then obviously he's not getting any points off that either. Um, so that so the like combination of those things put him on the back foot, and then uh, uh, when my reserves came on, I just I crumbled his flank. But then my that same flank then got crumpled by the dark Eldar, um, which made it fun. But he just, he just couldn't recover, and um, so yeah, that was that game. My other game. And then the two games that I lost, one was against Scott, and it was just like so, it was so back and forth the whole game. I made the absolute noob mistake, because my first game of the day, of forgetting that Leviathans have four hull points, not three. What? So, so I, no. took, I took them off a whole hull point early, which was totally my mistake, but, um, and then, yeah, a couple, a couple, like, late game, uh, like, he was running a Leviathan! <laughs> no, I know, but... He, like, I hadn't done much damage to his. I was kind of ignoring him. No, but I'm saying that, like... Oh, it, he should have said something? Yeah. No, he, yeah, I mean, he wasn't paying attention. He thought it was, he thought he'd done the fourth one. And okay. when we when we came back, when I realized it later, when when he took off his, he's like, oh, they're out four all points. I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> four. Oh, yeah. I haven't played this game in six months or whatever. Um, anyways, so a couple late game things where it was like, I'm going to charge this, and if this goes well for me, this is a swing of, like five points, because not only do I kill a unit, but I also hold object, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And so I had, like, a couple situations like that, and one of them worked out, and one of them didn't, and, but that was the worst one for me, that it didn't work out on, and I really needed it, and it just, it was a, it was a lot closer than we ended up thinking, but, uh, yeah, I lost that one. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of forget my last game, so. Can't win them all. I heard a lot of people made really silly mistakes, and I don't know what, like, Phil told me he was looking at the wrong army list for his first game. Oh no! <laughs> he put down his like jet bikes, and then he was like, "Oh wait, I shouldn't have had that spot on the table." <laughs> so he was playing with like two hundred points more than he should have. That's rough, man. Yeah, especially out of that book. Yeah, did he crush the opponent? They called it a, a tie because of that. He, he went up and said he said, offered a loss, and his opponent was like, "He would have kicked my ass anyway." So let's just call right. it a tie. Right. right, right. Uh, what the books it? actually really, uh, Towns of the Emperor got really toned down in the FAQ. I like I I played against Phil and. I knew I was playing against Phil in that game I played, so I went hard because I don't feel bad going hard against any uh, army from that book. But uh, no, they did a really good job of, of balancing them out. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's take a quick little break and then come back and uh, talk about them clowns. Battle Brothers Studios is a commissioned painting studio in Toronto, Canada. We want you to walk into the battlefield looking your best. So, if you're having trouble getting all your minis painted, or are in a big rush to get some stuff done for that next event, then let us know. Facebook.com slash Battle Brothers Studios for a free quote, and inquire also about our 2018 deals. This year, we're running a 10% discount on any new release item from any miniature company. That's pretty cool, so send us a message. Hello everybody, this is Adam. And I'm Jay. And we are in Counter War Gaming. And we wanted to celebrate hitting our 1,500 subscribers and give back to all of you who helped us get here. Super exciting. So we call this the 2,500 subscriber 
Forge Bane giveaway. That's right, because we're giving away a Forge Bane box. Woohoo! But in order to give it away, we have to hit our 2,500 subscriber goal. Makes sense. All right, so first things first, share this. Share the podcast with your friends. Uh, share our videos. Yeah. <laughs> share anything you want. <laughs> so there you go. Um, multiple ways to enter. Right. Number one, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Woohoo! That'll get you one entry. Number two, follow on Twitch for one more entry. Oh, so you can support us on our Patreon campaign, and that'll get you five entries. Wow. All right. Crazy. And hey, guess what? If you subscribe on Twitch, you get five more entries. Damn. And lastly, it, for all of you who are listening to the podcast right now, go on and leave us a review, and we'll get you one more entry. Bonus. Guys, so this is a big thank you for all the support that you have given us over the last couple years. Absolutely. Thanks to everyone out there for uh, making this a wild ride for us. Hopefully we can give one of these boxes to one of you lucky people. Sweet. Hey, remember to share, and we will see you at our next encounter. Good day. How are you now? Tried to paint a mini the other day. Realized my brushes were drier than a Saskatoon field in May. So I did what any reasonable man in his mid-thirties would do, and I hopped over to thewarpainter.com to resupply. Thewarpainter.com is Canada's greatest hobby store for all things hard to find. Scale 75, Broken Toad, The Army Painter, and Valet Ho. All supporters of Encounter Wargaming get 10% off their first order with the code EWG10. They got you covered. Quick crown Oh, I screwed uh, up all together. Oh, you messed everything up. I messed everything. Everything up. was horrible. Quit clowning around, Adam. Jeez. All right. So one, Nick, tell me what beer you opened. Uh, this is a Muskoka Brewery Harvest Ale. Uh, it was their brewery's first pioneering adventure into limited run beers, dry hopped and brewed using hand selected Ontario ingredients. This ale has a rich malt backbone. And a subtle grassy character, reminiscent of a freshly cut harvest. It's our way of celebrating another prosperous growing season. I think we got to stop reading can copy because it's always horrible, right? That's the point. That's why we do it. It's part of the charm, <laughs> is it? I hate it. <laughs> well, you're you're in publishing. Well, I was. That's fair. But I still have basic reading comprehension. <laughs> um. All right. So one. Let's take a sip of this beer. Yeah. It smells nice. Yeah, pretty pretty light golden color there. Oh yeah. That's just a nice ale. Yeah, there's nothing really to talk about. No. Like Oh come on guys. It's no. crisp, it's good. Yeah. It's got a good flavor. Yeah, there you go. See, now we're talking about something. Wait, well, it's a good ale, I think it's a good Yeah, it's got like a mostly like back of the throat, back of the tongue feel. I, think yeah, I could drink a, a, bit, I could a drink good bitter. Six of these on a Friday night. Yeah, yeah, they're they're so nice. It's, so it's sessionable. It is sessionable. Um, yeah, it's mostly clear. So, have a fine time with that. Um, yeah, but let's talk about the Harlequins. Not Harley Quinn. No. Uh, nope. Um. So the Harlequin. What are they? They're sort of like they. Well, they're Eldar. Um. So they're one of the distinct groups of Eldar that, uh, like, were affected by the fall. So we have the Craft World Eldar, the, when people say Eldar, that's what they're talking about. We have the Dark Eldar, or Drew Carey. Um, they went into the webway and created a city in there named Cremora. We, we know about that. We did an episode. Go back and listen to it. It was great. Uh, then there's the Exodites. Ooh, it's at six point seven percent. Ooh, but are... okay. That changes my perception of that beer a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you know what? If you make like a an almost seven percent beer taste like that, you're doing all right. I think yeah. so. Um, maybe it's a little less sessionable mm, for you. <laughs> um, yeah. So then there's the Exodites. They settled worlds, uh, and we don't know a ton about those. They ride dinosaurs. They don't ride dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> People like to say they ride dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, and then we have the Harlequin, which um, traditionally were just performers. 
uh, they they're sort of uh, connected to the Eldari gods in a way that um, we don't we don't see in the rest of the Eldar. They perform dances that are the their creation myths. Their their sort of um, their prophecies. Their their the story of their gods like marriages and defeats and battles. Like, are they just dances, or is it more like theater? It yeah, it's kind of theater. Okay. It's sort of. Yeah, like it, it. I guess theater makes more. Not sense. Not like a vaudeville show. <clears throat> no, more, more, more like uh, when when the 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 Royal Shakespeare Company is out of money, so everything is just interpretive and it's really neat. Uh, it's like ooh, it's deep and like little things must mean stuff. Nope, we're just broke. Um, so these guys are performers, and a lot of the rules kind of represent their acrobatics or their their um their ability to like appear in places where they ought not to they have like dramatic entrances and they they uh rise in crescendo yeah like they're they're the artists of like an already artistic race um and every fighting force is organized into troops or masks uh and they're usually led by like um a troop master or a shadow seer or a, uh, what's the other one? Death Jester? And these are, like, different roles in the troop. So the Death Jester plays death. Or, like, that kind of embodiment. And, like, the Troop Master organizes everything. Um, of special note in the organization is the... Well, I'll get to the Solitaire in a second. So, what... Where where do the... Elder, well, where do the Harlequin live? They are the masters of the webway, so they just, they're nomads that are, like, constantly moving throughout the webway. So, as opposed to the Dark Eldar, who live in it, they have a city, the, uh, the Harlequins are constantly moving about, and kind of, um, one of the, one of the big places that they congregate is the Black Library. And, uh, the reason that they're in the Black Library is because they're, they're guardians of that uh, they sort of protect the Black Library, and for those of the, you that don't know, Black Library is, is it an Eldar construction that's older than the Eldar sort of Yeah, thing? it's like, where, it's not, it's, it's where they hide things. Yeah, so it's the sum total of all the knowledge that the Eldar have ever had. Not even, it's like stuff that they don't want to know. Yeah. They'll put it, which is a weird way of looking at it. Yeah, I kind of like that. I've, um, always, I've always liked the Black Library, it's like Armin's quest yeah, he's been in there. His, uh, so is Magnus, I think. Yeah. Um, Didn't Gilliman get taken near there? Near outside? I don't know. No, sure. Okay. Um, so the reason that they're protecting this is... and the, Well, the reason that the Harlequin are still alive is because they are devotees to the Eldar trickster god that we're going to call Kagorak. Because uh, <laughs> it's like fake space language, so God only knows. Uh, but he's the trickster god. So, he, the reason that he's a trickster and, like, well, he he just loves plots. And, like, he's sort of, uh, like, dance fusion Loki. But he, uh, he does an interesting thing where he manages to steal souls of Harlequins away from Slaanesh. So, the, the Harlequins don't use soul stones. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, they're, the reason that they are so devoted is, like, he actually shows up and puts in work. Um, and, like, you know, when they die, they are not consumed. And this is why this solitaire that I mentioned uh, is, like, they occupy this weird uh, space in Eldar society. They're essentially an untouchable, um, but no one knows their identities. So, they're just walking around amongst the population uh and when an eldar troop shows up and it's doing the uh the performance of the final act the this solitaire will like get ready and they show up and they assume the role of slanish in this uh in this performance which is like crazy <laughs> like d- like it's 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 upsetting to people like the eldar race because imagine like the devil blew up Asia, and now you have, like, a story about the devil and someone's playing him, like, and that role is cursed sort of thing. Like, it's it's terrifying to the Eldar. Um, 
And yeah, so like even touching one of these performers is is like to invite a weird grisly demise later in your life. Like they're an untouchable class just keeps coming to the top of my mind. I just wanted to call that out. So yeah, these these guys um they often act as ambassadors of like what's best for the Eldar on the whole, uh, whether that's with other Eldar or with people in the Imperium. Like, it's often uh, a, a Harlequin troop or a Harlequin troop master who's, like, telling a planetary gov- governor, like, hey, you need to, like, move this population or, like, Slanesh is just going to eat it right up because they love foiling Slanesh's plans because that's why they they sort of exist is to really I didn't realize they were that public interesting yeah yeah like they so they used to not be um, but like in the fluff as as the the riff is opening and the the mm. millennia has gone on uh, they've just been like ramping up like how 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 much they're how visible they are. Hmm. Um, and I guess is appropriate considering now they have their own codex and they're a dominant player in yeah. 40k. Yeah. Uh, and then the last thing on the fluff is uh, like every good 40k codex, there's an apocalypse theory in here because this game is basically built on astrological dread. Oh. Um, and that's the es- final. Eschatological, you mean? Yes. Es- the, like, the end of yeah. things? Oh, yeah, yeah. Eschatological, yeah. Es- what did I say? Eschatological? S- something yeah. or other. Um, so, yeah, in, in the Black Library is this crystal tome that tells the story of the final act. And what that is, is Kagarok's final trick, which is uh, convincing Slanesh to expand its power, uh, not in an attempt to absorb all of the Eldar, but like tricking it into then being the saving grace of the Eldar. Uh, and how that's going to happen, who knows, might not. Uh, but anyways, that's that's sort of what they believe. I love it. Yeah. Well, and, well done, buddy. Right? That's good. I, I, learned, I learned a lot there. And I kept it concise this time. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't ramble a lot. It helps that they don't have a lot of special characters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's another really cool thing. Is if you see the models, they all are wearing masks. Yeah. So you, I don't think you'd have an identity. You would pl- you would be playing a literally an, a character in a play, right? Yeah, like you're a role. Yeah, um, they have unique characters. We'll get to that. Well, yeah, that's that's the fluff. Um, well, there's a couple things. There's some really cool uh, battles that yeah, they, uh, take us that through they get those. involved with. So, uh, two really stood out to me, not for any fluff reason, but just because they were kind of cool. So there's this one great one where this uh, solitaire, which is basically just like a lone um, dude, highly skilled, goes after this imperial governor. No reason, nobody knows why, uh, and nothing can stop him from going after the governor. So because uh, there's a warp storm, the governor can't leave the system, so he's fleeing from one world to the other. Entire regiments of bodyguards are getting killed by this one solitaire. <laughs> Just killing them all. Finally, he gets him cornered in a in a palace, and the governor at this point has abused his authority to uh, authorize the deployment of an Evasor <laughs> to fight the solitaire. And they fight for, for a couple days... Uh, a couple of days. Like, can you imagine fighting someone for that long? Well, it'll be like stalking each other through the palace and oh, okay, all yeah, that. Fair um, so he finally lures the Evasaur into the basement near the governor. Oh, and near no. the governor is good kills a- the Evasaur assassin, and the Evasaur assassin does a up. meltdown and kills all three of them. Amazing. And nobody knows why. <laughs> And nobody knows why. I uh, yeah, that's that's such a rad. That would be just a cool short story. Yeah, like, like that. That is that's classic Harlequins in my mind. Yeah, yeah like just, that kind of secretive. Like, what are you? Why is this happening to yeah, me? We don't understand you. And meanwhile, all you hear are like finger symbols and bells and stuff, <laughs> while your dudes are just getting ripped to shreds. <laughs> Uh, also important, uh, to know that they don't often feel, like, large, they're, they're a very elite army, they're sort of, 
uh, what the Custodes are to the Space Marine, what uh, or what Harlequins are to like Craft World Eldar. You're gonna have like a highly, highly elite uh, group of forces. It's gonna be moving crazy fast, um, and it's going to be a monster to paint. Uh, you see a lot of uh, Harlequin patterned uh, stuff, so like that weird diamond um, leggings, and just it's a it's a real flex on your painting abilities. Yeah. So we've talked about uh, this particular incident before, but it's interested. Interesting to hear it from this aspect, because we've heard it from the aspect of the Dark Eldar, and now we're going to hear it from the viewpoint of the Harlequins, which is Vex, Fall, and Rise. Oh, in cool. Kamra. I didn't even get... Oh, thanks for reading that, Nick. Uh, so, because like a whole bunch of demons assault the Dark City and Vect is done, um, a whole bunch of mandrakes kill him, as we know. We've talked about that before. And what is not mentioned is that upon his first rise to power... Azru Azru Badul, as Drew Bale, as Drew Bale Vect, had a pact with the Veiled Path uh, of okay. the Harlequins, and they stage a wake for Vect. Uh, everybody comes. Um, only Lady Malice fails to appear. And well, we the, talked about that part. And in the midst of their performance, uh, the Harlequins fire off their hallucinogenic grenades, and proceed to kill all of the Archons. Uh, and then, through all of their power combined, Vect rises from a column of dark energy and declares himself a living dark muse. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and the Veiled Path disappears. So there's definitely a link between Vect. It was definitely linked to his initial rise to power over the, over Kamraga. Well, Kamura. the funny thing is... Like, this is the sort of thing where, like, if you think you're using the Harlequins, you're not. Like, if you're like, I'm going to use their power and they're going to install me, it's like, no, 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 no. They need you somewhere. But this seems like he's just one of them. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think, like, my reading of that is, like, he's just declaring himself this, so, like, they respect him. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Like, I, I just way. think it's, like, a crazy power play. That too, but I mean, I, I think uh, keeping the Dark Eldar in check as a, a force to use against Slanesh is probably pretty helpful to the uh, the end goals hmm. of Interesting the Space Clowns. Theory. You heard it here first, folks. Maybe. Did you? I don't know. <laughs> so we don't have a... I didn't read this on 1D4 chain this time. Uh, there's not a ton. No. Uh, so there's not a lot of actual units. I'm going to count them up here. There's one, two, three... Six, seven, eight, eight, eight. Frag man, <laughs> I would be pissed off if I played nine. If you include a uh, a piece of terrain, <laughs> um, so we're gonna blow through. We're gonna hit six of them. Um, so I'll start with uh, two that uh, that I I like a lot. Uh, just so we all get a fun one. Let's not but each of us take one. I guess yeah, special yeah. character. <laughs> Uh, so I have always loved the, uh, the Death Jester. So good. He's just a really cool, weird-looking model with, like, half a real face and half a skull face, but the whole thing still looks like a skull. And he's basically a sniper. Uh, not a very good sniper, because his, uh, long-range weapon is only 24. Um, but there is an awesome relic that you can give to this guy that makes him just brutal. So he's basically got a Shrieker cannon, um... If you kill, you're, like you want to fire this at weak enemy models, mm -hmm. so he can target characters. But if let's say he shoots it at a, an orc unit, uh, kills an orc, uh, the unit then suffers D three mortal wounds. Rough. So he just needs to kill one unit in a one model in a unit, and the rest of the unit suffers D three mortal wounds. Um, and any models in a unit that are slain by this weapon subtract two from the unit's leadership. So you can get some pretty serious uh, debuffs on there. You can advance and charge. You can fall back and shoot and charge in the same turn. That's a very common uh, rule for Harlequins. Uh, can always snipe out characters. Um, terrain and models do not impose any sort of movement penalties for him. Uh, that's almost every... Uh... Harlequin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the coolest one, and I really like this is if any models flee from a unit 
in the same turn that it has been attacked by this model, not killed, but attacked, <laughs> you get to choose the first model that flees instead of your opponent. Hilarious. So you can rip a sergeant or a heavy weapon or something that you really don't like in the squad out of a unit if... Like, let's say one guy runs away. Just picturing how that looks in the fluff, he's just like, he picks the guy with the plasma gun. He's just like, shooting around this guy, like, blows up his fellow's head right next to him. He's just like, trying to get him. Like, it's just... Just trying to scare him off. <laughs> this is great. Uh, and then the, uh, another really cool ones are the Skyweavers. So these are their, their jet bikes. Mm -hmm. Um, they have bolas, and not the stupid Texas ties. Well, they're bolos. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and they're awesome. <laughs> they're star bolas. Uh, so basically, these are kind of like their mid-support and their anti-vehicle stuff. They've got a haywire cannon, which does uh, D6 shots. Every time you roll a wound of 4 plus against a vehicle, it takes another mortal wound. A wound roll of 6 is D3 mortal wounds. Not bad. I don't know how good that is. The star bolas are amazing. They're 12 inches grenade. Uh, strength 6, AP negative 3, and 2 damage. Nice. Super good. 4 plus invulnerable save, minus 1 to hit them, and they auto advance 6 and can advance and charge, so basically they're, they're going 22 inches and then charging. Rough. And they, yeah, and they've got a pretty good weapon too. They have the Zephyr Glaive, which is a plus 1, AP negative 2, 2 damage sword. That's oh, 4. Strength 4. Yeah, so like, it's not that great. Yeah, you'll find that a lot. With, you'll look at the weapons and you'll realize it is everyone does basically have an Eldar stat line. Mm -hmm. So you are really going to have a tough time against tougher characters. Yeah. Adam, you want to you wanna talk about some stuff that you like? Yeah, I'll talk about some stuff that I like. So I'm gonna, my, <laughs> my two are going to be related to each other. So I'll start off with just the basic troop. Um, I just... They're just so effective. Like, the ability to give everybody in the unit a fusion pistol, I was saying this to you guys before, um, it's just so good. Yeah. Because they're shotguns. Speaking like, of shotguns, let's open a beer. Gosh, I'm, sure. I'm not shotgunning a... I'll shotgun a tall can. I don't give a shit. A Palaco <laughs> nut brown ale. So this is a staple. The nut brown ale is really common in Toronto. You'll, you'll see it around. Um... It's a mahogany, English-American handcrafted brown ale. Oh, we've definitely. Notes of chocolate and roasted hazelnut. <laughs> Paul's like trying to shut it down. No, we've definitely. Don't read it. Paul's like, don't read it. We've had this on the podcast before. We've From done bonfires to snowshoeing, <laughs> this well-balanced, easy-drinking brew is available year-round for your drinking pleasure. It's pretty good beer, though. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. <laughs> Anyways, the so, troop. The troop. Um, so what is it? R O U P E. That's, yeah, everything's French. There you go. Um, yeah, I think that's how that word is in English too. Yeah, where do you think they got it? English just goes through the pockets sure. of other languages and takes what it wants. It's true. Mm -hmm. mm. Nutty brownie. Nutty brownie, chocolatey. Mm -hmm. It tastes like winter. Yeah. Nice dark color, but you can still see through it. Like, yeah, that's a... It's easy. That's an after-ski beer. Yeah. A pre-ski. So anyways, this the troop here, basically the whole the whole army, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find something in here that doesn't have a 4 plus and vulnerable save, so the troop as well has a 4 plus and vulnerable save um, coming from their hollow suit. Uh, they have flip belts, which means they can jump over terrain and units as if they were not there. That is literally how it's written in the rules. Um, and then, uh, they can advance and fall back and charge, which is super neat. So, um, yeah, but these, these fusion pistols are, are what I'm all about. Um, like just, just moving eight, flying across the battlefield in, inside of their transport, which is the next unit that I'm going to talk about. And then still having your pistols like unloading on some big tank or some knight and just, just getting in melter range so easy because you're so fast, and that's just that's just deadly. Show me where on the night model the Harlequins hurt you, Adam. Oh man, they, they so I actually one of my games played was against the Harlequin and a Latok army, and uh, I think the the guy was just intimidated. I took my Hogtowner list with my Gilliman and uh, 
repulsor shoulder pads um, for Gilliman, and he just wasn't aggressive enough. I hmm. mean, he had the he had the fusion pistols in, loaded up in his troop squads in these in the what are they called star weavers or whatever. I'll get there in a second. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just he was just scared of me. I was like, I just have such a small army. You just need a you just need to rush me and just blow up one of these repulsors right away. Yeah, because yeah. that's a big handicap, right? I mean, Gilliman's scary for sure, but He's not that if, you, scary. if you take away the you know, the 28 guns <laughs> that he rolls around with on his shoulder pads. Like, he's not that good anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's still good by himself, but then you still have your whole army, and I'm, like, basically got nothing left. Um, anyway, so that was that was a big disadvantage. I mean, you just, you have such an opportunity with these units to do some real damage. Um, and especially with these more elite armies, a lot of knight armies hanging around, like, to be able to do everything and kill tanks is just so good. It feels nice. Yeah. So then let's let's get let's get on over to the uh, the Star Weaver. That was the correct name. I'm so proud of myself. Uh, this is how they get around. You know, they got that eight inch move. Um, there's a couple stratagems that make a whole bunch of this stuff in in this army move even faster. But here's your your 16 inch move flying transport that can carry six models. So that's a, just a standard five man troop squad and a character if you're so inclined. Um, they come stock with two Shrieking Cannons, which is an Assault 3 Strength 6 gun, uh, that basically has what we would call rending, so on a roll of a 6 to hit, it gets AP negative 3. I think that's all Shrieking weapons now. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, anyways, it's open top, so you can also shoot your pistols at the top of this thing, which is super cool. Um, when we get to stratagems later, there's also a way to advance this thing and still shoot your, your, uh... Um, crazy pistols as well, which is really cool. But uh, again, a four-up invuln minus one to hit to boot makes it um, just super super durable. Um, even though it only has toughness five and six wounds and a four-up save, um, the four-up invuln and minus one to hit make it um, yeah just a little bit a little bit less predictable to uh, to be able to kill it as easy as you might think. So yeah, there you go. Those are those are my winners. I would just put as much of those on the battlefield as I could. Well, I would take one of these because you're only allowed to take one. I would take the solitaire just because I one the model is cool as hell. So cool. Like it's it, it it's leaping over a piece of terrain. There's like sort of a, a digital shadow sort of happening on it. He's like, leaking diamonds. Like, he's leaking pixels. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of it, he's kind of pixelated on the cloak, yeah. uh, which is plays into the rules. Um, so, one, he's super fast, 12 inches of movement. Crazy! Yeah, hitting on two. He's got a two-up ballistic skill and no weapon, so that's cool. <laughs> um, uh, strength three, like standard, you know, toughness three. Five wounds, eight attacks, and like, a six-up save. Like, that's nothing to get mad at right there. No. Yeah. But, uh, this impossible form that I'm talking about, that he's all digitalized, uh, gives him a three-up invul. Uh, he's got a flip belt, so, like, intervening terrain and models doesn't matter. Um, and he can advance and charge in the same turn. Uh, he can fall back, you know, all that standard stuff. Uh, and it's armed with two weapons, a Harlequin's Caress and a Harlequin's Kiss. Um, Harlequin's Caress is one damage, AP minus two, plus two strength. Um, a Harlequin's Kiss is D3 damage, minus one AP, plus one strength. And the Harlequin's quit Kiss is like a crazy weapon. It's this long tube that you stab into someone through their armor, and then it shoots a monofilament wire into them, and then they just pull it out. So it's just like, yeah, it's just gooifying, dude, which is horrifying, and I love it. Um, but two, two other special rules that you really want to say for last when you're talking about this guy... <laughs> Uh, the first one is, uh, Path of Damnation, so it can never be the, your Warlord, uh, or it can't have a Warlord trait, it doesn't say you can't make it your Warlord. Uh, important distinction. Um, and then the other is Blitz. So once per battle, instead of making a normal move, you can add 2d6 to its move characteristics. In addition, its attacks are increased to 10 until the end of the turn, uh, and you can't use it if he's been affected by Twilight Pathway Psychic Power. So it's just like, it's stopping you from moving him 72 inches. Yeah. Um, but like, this is, and like, honestly, 
with a 12 inch move like you might not even need the extra movement um but 10 attacks strength 5 ap minus 2 1 damage like you're gonna be doing some work um but yeah i just love the idea of this guy like running down characters um and then the uh, the other unit before you move on like this is a perfect example of how breaking away from the the mold of 7th edition where like infantry are basically all the same is like so it's so much better the way this plays out mm -hmm. like the fact that this guy can just run 12 inches makes him so much more characterful than if he moved 6 and had all these complicated rules you had to try and remember like you just look at this yeah. guy, he moves 12, he's so fast, he's hard to hit, he's he's crazy and He's combat. gonna mince, like, small, like, one, small units with one wound, so, like, this is a Devastator Squad's worst nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Like, bloop, bloop, and he's just, like, wrecking up the backfield. Still only wounding on threes, against like toughness four. Yeah, but still. Yeah. I mean, the two-wound chart is a, just a hot piece of shit. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, got, I got no problem. Fight me. Hogtown or uh, inches and cubes at gmail.com. Fight me. Um, Change my mind. Yeah. You, well, yeah, no, you probably can't. Um, <laughs> then I'm going to talk about a webway gate. It's got. You went for that piece of terrain. <laughs> Hell yeah. Toughness 8, 14 wounds, 3 up save. That's it. The rest are null. Uh, so basically, when you set it up, uh, it can be anywhere in the battlefield that's more than 12 inches uh, from the enemy deployment zone and enemy models and more than 3 inches away from other terrain features um, or the center of objective markers. So you can't just park on an objective marker or like you can't throw it on top of a hill and just be like, I can't be reached. Uh, it's a mobile and it gives you a webway strike. So after you set it up, any Eldari units you have that uh, you haven't set up trade deployment other than fortifications can be set up in a, wood, in a webway spar rather than being set up on the battlefield. Uh, one unit in the webway spar can emerge from each friendly webway gate at the end of each of your movement phase. Um, and then it's the same thing. like you, Basically, you're deep striking them within three inches and nine inches away from enemy models. Um, but the problem is if they've destroyed your webway gates, all those guys just are considered to be dead. And, uh, yeah, that's that's just, like, a weird little unit to throw in. It's mostly fluffy. I don't see anyone ever taking this in their their army. Yeah, not not competitive army. No. no. Um, but, I mean, there's this stratagem that makes this thing a little bit better, which is kind of neat. We can get there. But um, I just noticed, like, mm -hmm. the actual model... Oh, it's hella cool. Yeah, it's a really yeah, cool Yeah, like, thing. it's got, like, this weird, almost, like, a little bit more feminine-looking, like, Wraith Lord statue on either side of it. And yeah. It's really it's, cool, man. It's shaped uh, in a very Yonic fashion. And I think those are definitely Wraith constructs that are powering the gate. Yeah. I'm just glad. Kind of dark. I'm just glad that I got to use the term Yonic. Yeah, what does that even mean? It's the female version of Phallic. Uh, uh, interesting. Now you know. Now I know. Um, and then, like, so instead of chapter tactics, they have mask forms. But it's interesting to note, before we get into that, that the only, like, army-wide special rule they have is objective security. True. They're very much kind of a... Not like a... They're, they're a cohesive fighting force, but not... Yeah. yeah. I don't know how to explain what I'm trying to say. There's no, like... Army-wide special rules, but every infantry member has a flip, or, yeah, a hollow belt. Yes, that's, yeah, like a flip enough, belt, yeah. or, like, you know, it comes through the, I, you get that same feel through their, um, their war gear, I feel, yeah, felt reading that's their fair. codex. Um, but then, uh, yeah, so their mask forms, you have stuff like, uh, the Midnight Sorrow, so this is the Art of Death, and, uh, they move with exceptional purpose and singular dedication in the open field of battle. And units with this form can move an additional D6 when they fall back. In addition, units uh, can consolidate up to 6 inches. So you're, you're definitely consolidating into... In yeah, you're, you're yeah. jet... Like, this you take on a detachment that you just need to jack up back lines. Yeah. Uh, my, my favorite one here is the Dreaming Shadow, the, the Somber Sentinels. 
Um, so they're grotesque and ghastly, and their only fear is that their eternal watch might falter or fall. So when a unit fails a morale test, only one model from this unit will flee, which is super cool because these guys are elite guys. Uh, their, their leadership is, is probably pretty high, you, uh, eight. usually like eight or nine, so not bad. You're not, you're not but, taking big units, but if you're rolling that six after you've lost three guys, yeah. It's bad. Um, but what's really good here is each time uh, a model with this keyword is slain or flees on a four up, you roll, that model can either shoot or fight before it's removed. Yeah, so they get a single attack, though. Nope. They can shoot with one of their ranged weapons as um, if it were the shooting phase, or make a single attack, yes. Yeah. So, like, you're not getting your full... No. It's like the banner. I don't know why... They limit that. I but. guess, like, so you don't... You, like... You have to pay a cost to slay these guys, but you're not... There's no, like, oh, man, I can't kill them because I'm going to take a full extra round of shooting. Like, it just needs to be a deterrent. It can't just be, like... I don't know, but it's a shooting game, and you get your full effectiveness of shooting, but not your full effectiveness in combat. I don't know. They've been nerfing combat for a while now. Yeah. yeah. Those stop come. it. Yeah. <laughs> Run you. Yeah. Um, so because of my unit choice selection, I may as well talk about the soaring spite. Uh, so this one is basically when your when your duders are inside that transport because it can fly, and uh, you want to be going as fast as you can. Um, if you advance, you normally can't shoot your pistols out of the top of it. Um, but the Soaring Spite will allow you to do that because it turns your pistols into Assault 1 weapons um, in the turn that you advance. Um, so and you also good. don't suffer a minus 1 to hit. So, super cool and makes the two units that I was talking about really work well together. Um, so What's the range go. on a Fusion Pistol? 12 or it's 18? Only, it's only 6. Only 6? Only 6, yep. You still do drive-bys. Yeah, oh, yeah, like, you gotta get right in there. Your melter range is only at three inches, but, uh, I mean, with how fast you're moving, it's still deadly. Yeah. And then there's, like, frozen stars where you just get plus one when you charge. One plus one attack. Yeah, but what I really like here is I don't think there's a clear standout as the absolute best. They're yeah. all kind of super cool. They're all very different. Um, I am kind of bummed out because I feel like this would have been a good opportunity to do kind of what they did with Dark Eldar, with uh, having different patrols, so you could have a couple different uh, masks in, in, in an army. Well, I think, like, quite literally, this is an an ally army. Like, this is an adjunct to other, Eldar like, armies. yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Like, I don't, I don't think as, it's... As opposed to small raiding parties teaming up together. Like, which right, is, I did think... a great job of giving that feel to Dark Eldar. Yeah, yeah, I think you're just supposed to see these guys as, like... An appendix to yeah. the codex. And they're like, they're kind of like, guys, what dance are we doing today? Like, yeah. what performance are we putting on? And so they put on those masks, and then they... I don't yeah, know. and then they go about popping and locking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's grab a couple of stratagems. Uh, so, I know Paul's <clears throat> going to love this one, because this is just right up his alley. It's called the Hundred Swords of Vol. And basically, right before the start of the first battle round, before the first turn begins, so you know who's going first, you know what's happening... <laughs> You pay one command point, and you just completely redeploy a Harlequin's unit from your army in your deployment zone. I love that one. I, that was actually going to be my one. Because <laughs> I was like, I love redeploys. Mm. I just, I like, I like a deke. I like, I like zigging when you thought I was going to zag. Yeah, uh, and then there's Aisha's Weeping. Um, and a lot of these are names of dances, which I, which I kind of like. Um... And this is responding to their loss whenever, uh, it's, it's, it's basically like you're freaking out and looking very mournful and, and grieving. And you use this stratagem at the end of any phase. Select a unit from your army that suffered casualties during the phase. Improve that unit's invulnerable save by one to a maximum of three up until the end of the turn. I like that one. It's like, Imagine how unsettling that would look on the field. Like, one guy dies and, like, everyone's just, like, rending their clothes and tearing at their hair and stuff. And, like... Or their masks just completely change without them. <laughs> yeah, and, like, they're just impossible to shoot now. Like, it's just... It's so creepy. 
Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I really like that one. And also, I like bringing up Aisha anytime I can. <laughs> and that's that's highly that's highly practical for oh, like hella practical being, for like being competitive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, prismatic blur is on the same line of that, and those two like would really go well together. Where it's just. Uh, a Harlequin unit from your army that's advanced now has a 3 plus invulnerable save. Which I like the way they word that. It's not like, oh, you get plus 1, right? It's, so you, no. get, you get rid of these stacking problems, but it's just straight up 3 plus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And for one command point, like you're doing that every turn on a unit. Same, same with the one you mentioned. Yeah. Probably. Aisha's weeping. You need something to stick around. You're doing this. Mm -hmm. So then the other one you're probably doing every turn. Uh, I, I see 3. I mean, with, with yours as well, that's probably 4 you're doing every turn. Um, the other one's the minus one to hit, the standard Dark Elder one, but Fire yeah. and Fade is super cool too, uh, where you just move seven inches as if it's the movement phase. After, um, That's... Him, after the Harlequin's unit shoots. So you, it's, it's that Tau rule, right? Where you move, you shoot, and you move again. Which yeah. Is super cool. So here's one reason why you would take the Webway portal, and it's... Your opponent would have to not know about this stratagem, but you can pay one command point to do one of two things. Either two units can emerge from the webway at the same time, or one unit can emerge from the webway and be set up more than one inch away from enemy enemy models. So yeah. if you have any buddy who's like hogging around your webway, you're just like, surprise! <laughs> Guess what? We're in combat now, idiot. Um, and then there's Mirthless Hatred. Uh, the Chaos God Slanesh is rival, uh, reviled by all Eldari, Eldar, idiot, you spelled it wrong, uh, who despises his followers with a ferocious loathing. These devotees uh, of the Laughing God, however, harbor a particular hatred for she who thirsts. And you use this stratagem against anything that has the Slaneshi keyword, and you uh, re-roll hits and failed wounds uh, for all attacks. Till the end of the phase pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, it's very situational. Um, yeah, and then uh, did you want to go into anything else? Anything? Yeah, psychic powers. There's uh, there's two that really... Oh, and for, yeah, shadow seers have psychic powers. Oh yeah, sorry, we, we, we missed that one. Yeah, they're the, they're, they're the wiggly fingers of this army. Yeah, they can do two and there is a stratagem. I think it's one command point. Let's them do another one. That's yeah. Well, they've kind of got a couple cool ones. They've got one power that uh, reduces the enemy unit, uh, their hit rolls by one. They've got another one that targets a friendly unit that reduces anything against them. So you could probably double those up to give a... a if you have a key unit that you need to protect against a unit that you know is going to shoot at them, you can double cast those and then the enemy's at minus two to hit, which is kind of a cool combo. But then Mirror of Minds is such a fun, random one. Uh, so select an enemy unit within 24 inches. Both players roll off. If the Harlequin's player roll is equal to or greater than the opponent's, the target unit suffers one mortal wound. Repeat <laughs> until the target is destroyed or the enemy player rolls higher. Uh, yeah. I yeah. like it. It's kind of goofy. Yeah. I feel like it could be some, some fun. Yeah, I mean, like... Gilliman got into a Mirror Minds War with a Shadow Seer in the game I played, so... How'd that work out? I mean, I, I won the roll right away, so... Oh, okay. Kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah, like, this is a thing that I don't like. I feel like you should get the one mortal wound and then start rolling. Yeah. Um, just because, like, that's, that's the way that it ought to work. Uh, yeah, and then do we have any relics? Well, we have Enigmas of the Black Library... Well, there's some warlord traits. Are there? Yeah. So we talked about the uh, the dreaming shadow, the mm -hmm. one where you uh, on a three up, sorry, on a four up, you get to shoot or fight again. The warlord trait here um, is you add plus one to those rolls if you're within six inches of your warlord, and you're adding plus two if there are any Necron units on a battlefield. So mm -hmm. if you're facing Necrons on a two up, uh, you're shooting or fighting again before you die. Not bad. Like, kind of cool. And then the one that uh, Adam was talking about, where they can advance and shoot pistols, uh, your warlord can disembark from a transport even after it moved. That's pretty good. 
I like Luck of the Laughing God, where you can reroll hits and wounds uh, and damage rolls of one for your warlord. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, it basically turns you into a halfling. So. Yeah. Yeah, Fractal Storm, another character gets a three up invuln. Like, just so survivable. Yeah, and like, these are way better than other warlord traits. Like, yeah. let's just, let's take a sec. Like the Space Marine ones? Space Marine ones are just a pile of dog <laughs> shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, Storm of Fire is, hands down, one of the best warlord traits in the game. Okay, so there's a cherry on top of a tightly coiled turd. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so then, uh, the Enigmas of the Black Library, uh, Suit of Hidden Knives, uh, which I just love. Can, uh, I, can I pause you right there? Yeah, yeah. That bottle cap fell very far. Yeah, it went a ways. Hmm. Uh, what'd you got there? Yeah, this comes from, I still had this laying around for my trip to Ottawa. This is from Tooth and Nail Brewery out there. It's called Valor. Um, it's got a big cow on the front. Saison? Yeah, it's a Saison. I bet that cow is somebody. I it was that... bottle conditioned. Okay. Okay. So. Multi, what is it? Multi grass? Multi grain. Multi grain. Yeah. Also, I think that's two cows or one cow with six legs. Yeah, a bunch of legs. What's up with that? I don't know. Lots of legs. Pour that out. Yeah. All right. Pour that out for the homies. I got you, bro. All right. You're uh, awesome. Yeah, so the suit of hidden knives is uh, roll a d6 each time a roll of one is made. What have you done? Oh. Jeez, it's like someone shook it up. It's that it's bottle tasty. conditioning, baby. Yeah. It's tasty, though. Um, yeah, so roll d6 each time a roll of one is made for an enemy model targeting the wearer in the fight phase. On a two up, Thanks, that sir. unit suffers a mortal wound. That's super cool. Yeah, so you're basically punching a guy with knives in his pants. Nick, you want to tell us about one? Yeah, there's Curtain Fall, which is a upgrade for a Death Jester. Um, essentially, it's very similar to a Death Jester's weapon, except it gets plus one strength and uh, a better AP value on uh, both its two things. And... Every time you make a rune roll of 6+, the hit result, hit is resolved at AP negative 4. I like that. Yeah, it's not bad at all. That's a really cool name for a thing, too. Curtain Fall? Yeah. Like, I want to call something that. <laughs> Have you guys seen the, the video um, with the parakeet and the dude, like, stands in his doorway behind a blanket and oh, drops yeah, yeah, it yeah. but disappears, and the parakeet's just like, what the... <laughs> Let's just play with, with, like, let's let's just convincing <laughs> animals you're a god. Like, that's not smart. But it's hilarious. Uh, yeah, uh, alright, the one, uh, another one that I really like is Kagorok's Rose. Um, and a model with the Harlequin's kiss only, so you can give it to your Harlequin. Ooh. Uh, oh, and, can you try this real quick? Yeah, okay. It's quite nice. It's definitely a saison. Oh, it smells good. Ooh, tastes like juice. Yeah. Oh, that's it's really less, nice. It's less sweeter than I was thinking it was going to oh, be. Oh, I'm into that. That is a good breakfast beer is what that is. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Like, I would I would have that at 10 in the morning. Um, but yeah, so uh, basically you can re-roll failed to wound rolls with this. Uh, and when attacking infantry, it has a damage of 3. <laughs> so like, that's... It's so like, what kind of infantry? Like, Death Guard for sure, to make them roll tons of... Uh, disgustingly resilient. Like, yeah, what, where else is that really practical? Primaris Marines, I guess. But. Yeah, anything with more than one wound. Yeah. yeah. We still only wounding them on fours, but you're re-rolling. Or anything that has like a feel no pain e thing. Yeah. Just like push saves, man. Yeah. Ob- obliterators. How many wounds do they have each? Three. Perfect. Yeah. There you go. Toughness five. So you're wounding them on fours though. No one toughness four. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, they brought them down. They need it. Like honestly, they're they're so good. <laughs> Well, they lost their power fists, and their toughest four, which they yeah. needed that too. Yeah, they didn't need that because no one was taking marauders, maulers, mutilators. Yeah, whatever. No one does them anyways. No, they're uh, those models are garbage. Both of them are garbage. True. Uh, and then there's a great one which you is an auto take for any solitaire. Um, it's just simply you can't fire Overwatch. <laughs> yeah, that's Definitely. really good. Because Must- it's like, oh, you get a three plus invulnerable save. Uh, can't fire Overwatch. It's like, God, uh, both, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I already have a three plus invulnerable save. Yeah. Now you're just covered. You're, 
Yeah. They're good. And then, uh, do you got one more there, oh. Adam? Or do you do... No, I was busy pouring beer. You got a good one? I don't know. Uh, uh, all right. right. Well, let's just talk about tactical objectives. Sure. Tactical. Tactical? Tactical. Man, this is, what, this is what we get for doing, like, two strong beers in a night. So there's two really cool ones uh, in here that are kind of interesting. Everything else is, you know, your standard kill a unit, um, fall back, or, like, force your enemy to fail a morale test. Um, but one is interesting, so it's called Trickery and Deception. When this tactical objective is generated, each player secretly nominates an objective marker. At the end of your turn, each player declares if you control the nominated objective marker. Score one victory point if you control either objective marker. If you control both of them, or you both nominated the same one, and the Harlequins player now controls it, you score D3 victory points instead. Nice. That's an interesting one. That's weird. Because you want to you want to get into your opponent's head and be like, "What's he thinking? What's he think I'm going to declare? Does he think I'm going to throw rock, or does he think I'm going to throw scissors?" And then uh, score a victory point if you control the objective marker whose number corresponds to the current battle round number. Whatever. But with the trickery and deception <laughs> thing, they make you choose it at the end. So like. Your opponent could just choose one that you're not controlling. No, when the tactical objective is generated, each player secretly nominates. Oh, when it's generated. Order. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So you, yeah, you get a chance to something. Yeah. Interesting. So that's Harlequins. Yeah. Is anyone like I have a really bad sense of smell, so I have to like confirm with you guys. Is anyone getting that like farmhouse? Oh, very much. Farm, so. yeah, yeah, like yeah. I was gonna say, like old hey. old boot, like yeah, but yep. in a good sense of an that's old boot. Stays on, yeah. man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice, love it. I mean, saisons are all kind of different depending what what you put this in. This is them, but Barney. Yeah, Barney. Oh, you know what? Now, now it makes sense why there's a cow on there because it smells like a barn. Yep. There you go. There it is. All right, that's Harlequins. Uh, final thoughts. Still doesn't make sense why there's a cow with six legs. Oh well. Oh oh. Um, six legs are better than two, four legs. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Good talk. I want to ride my sky weaver. I want to ride my sky. I want to ride my sky weaver. Spooky uh. time. <laughs> oh, so spooky. <laughs> I love Halloween. Say Halloween. I really do. So I will be finding Toronto ghost stories for you all this month. I'm not upset about that. But uh, the first one we've got. Uh, from a CBC article um, by oh, <laughs> Liberal Rag. There's nobody who, uh, who has a byline on it. Okay. So, unexplained lights in the windows, strange blood stains on the staircase, his shadowy form gliding across the sand in the moonlight. For those who believe it's haunted, those are just some signs of a, that a ghost dwells in the walls of a lighthouse. I mean, I'm pretty sure if you don't believe it's haunted and you see somebody... If you see blood stains everywhere and a shadowy form gliding across the sand in the moonlight. I feel like the blood is enough to be like, well, this place, it's like some bad stuff went down, right? So, 2018 marks the 203rd anniversary since lighthouse keeper J.P. Radden Miller disappeared from his post at the Gibraltar Lighthouse, which is on the Toronto Islands. I, I tried to go up in that at a wedding I was at on the weekend, and I was so drunk I forgot about it. <coughs> Oh, you just remembered. Yeah. I'm actually really mad. Was there blood on the walls? Uh, no idea. <laughs> but the whereabouts of his remains continue to be a mystery. It was a cold night in 1815, one day after New Year's. Uh, German board Radden Mueller, sorry, I said Miller before, I corrected as Mueller, uh, supplemented his income as a lighthouse keeper by brewing his own beer. Uh, and legend says he was killed by some soldiers thirsty for some suds. My guy, I'm going to tell you what happened to him. So there was a garrison of soldiers close to where Hanlon's Ferry Ferry Dock stands today. Um, the War of 1812 <laughs> had just concluded, and while various agreements uh, would have been signed in Europe, soldiers remained on the island, and the war, I don't think, was over until like halfway through 1815, because they, like, they signed the peace treaty, but then obviously they don't have Facebook, so it took a while. True. Also, the fact that it's at Hanlon's Point, for people that don't know, that's the nude beach, so I'm just picturing a bunch of naked soldiers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, a bunch of soldiers, like, the metal helmet, a rifle, and, like, 
dinger just hanging right out. <laughs> so the harbor was frozen. Uh, it would have been cold, like 1815 Toronto would have sucked in the winter. Okay, so maybe not hanging, but yeah. whatever. Uh, so there wasn't much else for soldiers to do, and they were out on a march. Um, it probably wasn't that cold, and the beer froze at a much lower temperature, or higher temperature than it should have frozen at, which kind of gave away that a they got certain watered-down beer. Mad Mueller had watered down their beer. That gold brick and son of a biscuit. So they beat him up, and he denied the accusations, and they chased him to the top of the lighthouse, and they had an altercation. And the exact details are lost to history, but he was never seen again. It said he was thrown from the top of the lighthouse, and when the soldiers looked down to see the body, it was gone. And, like, I've been at this lighthouse. They would have to throw him a good 30 to 40 feet for him to land in the water. Though it is, like, rough brush, so it might have just been bushes. And it's also a bunch of drunk soldiers who are mad that they weren't getting drunk enough. It's true. So... So the body was never recovered. And then in 1904... A, a new lighthouse keeper discovered human remains nearby and reburied them. No DNA testing was ever done. Wait, what year was were the remains found? 1904. I mean, that's still like recent enough that you go to the cops. You don't just be like, "I'll bury these up." I, that was, I think, that was before the islands were like really connected to Toronto. I don't. Yeah, but know. there's still a dead body. Like yeah, you would ask somebody, right? Toronto you, in 1904. I think if you dug anywhere in the downtown area you'll find a body yeah i'm just saying like if you if you walk in a line you find like a f- bone face uh what are those called skulls uh <laughs> find a skull you're gonna be like my guy who do i like i gotta i gotta let someone know right like that feels We're also cool. it's like definitely not something that happens to us every day where it's like i, I feel like I don't want to say back then, but like we're just a little more hands on with those types of things, maybe. But still, you would ask know. around, wouldn't you? Yeah, I don't know. It depends if he's looking at it and he's like, like it's 80 years later, basically, right? 85 yeah. years later? I guess. That's a but long, and ni- no, 90 years later, right? Still, 90 years later, you'd be like, yo, the university? Like, like but, but to the visual eye, you're like, these, these could be 100 year old bones, they could be like, 300-year-old bones? I, I feel like know. you still check, don't you? Probably make good soup with them. I would tell the cops. Yeah, I mean, marrow <laughs> takes a long time. Anyway. So in 1958, <laughs> uh, CBC News spoke to the last of the Gibraltar lighthouse keepers, D.D. Dodds. That was his name. That was a good name. When the moon is full, it's reflected back from the top of the lighthouse. This spring, when I was riding by on my bike, I was startled to see a light when the navigation system was shut down. It wasn't for a few seconds that I realized the moon was full, and it gave me quite a startle. I've never met a ghost, but I understand how a legend persists. The cooing of pigeons is very eerie on a dark night, and the wind howls through the lighthouse, giving you shivers. Uh, that's a poetic soul left alone for, like, too long. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah. Like, also, lighthouse keepers are nuts. They are. Did you ever hear the... Okay, one of my favorite lighthouse keeper story is that there were two lighthouse keepers, and they were not getting along... One of them went to go do maintenance on the outside of a lighthouse and slipped and fell and smashed his head in. And the other lighthouse keeper didn't want to be accused of killing him, so he tied his dead body to the outside of the lighthouse until the relief crew came. And he was like, look, I didn't kill him. He died, and I tied him to the side of the lighthouse. <laughs> like, it... Uh, I think I believe that guy, though, like... <laughs> Like, if I walked up, the guy was like, I'm trying to prove my innocence by tying this guy's fucking smashed head body to a tower. I'm like, ah, this couldn't have been, like, your master plan. <laughs> like, hmm. that was rough. Uh, That's a really nice lighthouse, though. I like lighthouses. There's a weird there's a weird thing about lighthouses. I think it's just because people are, are the, isolated there for yeah. so long. I used to work in a lighthouse. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was a tour guide. Oh, nice. Where? In, back home? Yep, in Labrador, at Point of More. It was a uh, lighthouse, the second tallest lighthouse in Atlantic Canada, made from locally quarried limestone. On the outside, it had a cedar shingle. Um, Just uh, one? Facade. No, no, it was an, a, a many. Uh, <laughs> at top, 
Uh, there was a Fresnel lens that was made in France uh, and enabled a mercury switch bulb to be seen over four miles, which was great because it could be seen clear across the straits. It, it is crazy. So there's a great old lighthouse that I spent a lot of time in up uh, near Tobermory. Uh, oh, man. I, uh, Wingfield Basin, which is kind of like a, a natural harbor. So when all the ships would come like out of Tobermory, that was the first place that they could shelter from the storm. Uh, and so it, it's called like the C- Cabot Head uh, Lighthouse. I've been there a lot because we spent a lot of time up there as kids. And this is the first year it's been shut down because they want to do renovations and there are unsafe levels of mercury. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to kill people. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, I went up to Tobermore a, a while ago with a bunch of friends and stuff. And we were like eating, eating breakfast uh, on the beach. And somebody was like, so like... This must be like pretty big, but like you grew up on the ocean, like the ocean was like huge, right? And I was like, functionally, this is the same size. Like, for what I'm gonna use it for, <laughs> yeah. this is as big as an ocean. <laughs> Where were we? What beach? Uh, I don't know, just some stony beach. We uh, we drove out of the campsite and then just like down nice. the road. Yeah. It was nice. Go to Tobermory. It is good. And also, don't kill people that serve you shitty beer. Or do. Oh, I don't know where I come down on this Drown one. Drown him in the beer! Like a monkey in a rocket on his way back home I can't 